Paul von Oberstein is a character so misunderstood, not just by the Empire's admirals, but by the viewers as well. Time and time again, the viewers criticized Oberstein as an immoral demon. Shafted aside, he was also hated by many in the Lone Ground Dynasty as a monster with too much power. He was often assumed to have been using Reinhardt as a tool. As for the man himself, nothing is really known about his past. Despite that, it is clear, based on his personality, that most likely he had a very rough upbringing. Always level-headed and logical, no one could ever debate him on truth. He was feared for having arguments so right that even Reinhardt admitted that Oberstein leaves no room for debate in them. Brolin Mariendorf would add that Oberstein's ideas go beyond right and wrong, as so correct in their thinking but also feared. That's because Oberstein understood clearly the necessity of getting one's hands dirty. This is what made his thinking more superior to the naivety of Kirchheis. Even Mittermeier would come to not only fear Oberstein, but also nearly lose his composure against him in discussions several times despite how much of a rational and composed man Mittermeier is known to be. Additionally, Oberstein would even put both Mueller and Binfield in their place, but get tackled by Binfield out of Binfield's frustration with him. Still, was he ever really wrong? Weren't his ideas bringing forth the most efficient results? There was a reason why Reinhardt, as much as he didn't like Oberstein as a person, kept him around and followed his advice the most. Despite Oberstein's weak physique, he more than made up for it with his mind. His Machiavellian political mindset made him the most extreme here, the most extreme hero. I would say he is the endgame of a just ruler who realizes the most efficient way to rule, sort of how, how the most wicked ruler understands the, that shrewd trickery and assassination are what keeps their power intact. They are opposites of each other's worst nightmare. This is because Oberstein realizes that the, that the morally obsessed ruler will fall due to his naivety. He told Reinhardt constantly to be a realist and that it is necessary to get your hands dirty as a ruler to uphold power. This is what would lead to Kirchheis to feel concern as he had warned Reinhardt that Oberstein is, is a dangerous man. At the same time, Oberstein noticed that and could not accept that Kirchheis was too morally naive for his own good. He would often speak critically of Kirchheis to Reinhardt. Like Jan Wenli, Oberstein had to deal with being an advisor to old nobles that didn't care about his advice, despite how correct it was. This foolish leadership led to the death of his entire fleet, but Oberstein would desert and leave as the only survivor. Though subject to being court-martialed now, he hated the nobles to the extent that he did not want to die with them such a needless death for a system he despised so much. He was aware of Reinhardt, his ideals, his rise in power, and saw an opportunity to not just save his own life, but to start a real movement against the Golden Bomb dynasty. He managed to meet with him and requested for Kirchheis to leave the room. He already knows what kind of a man Kirchheis is and didn't want him to hear what he had to say. Eventually, Kirchheis leaves and Oberstein explains that he was born with inferior genes and that this rotten system would have sent him to death with the inferior genes exclusion law had he been born during Rudolf's time. As a result, he was born blind, but was allowed to see with the installment of cybernetic eyes. Because of this outrageous law in the overall rotten system of the nobles, Oberstein took a bold risk and told Reinhardt, Do you want to stand? I hate them. Kaiser Rudolf and his descendants, all of those produced by him. The Galactic Empire, no, the Golden Bomb Dynasty must perish. If it is possible, I want to destroy it with my own hands. But I have no such talent. What I can do is aid in the entrance of a new leader. Your Excellency, Imperial Admiral Count Nohengram. How many times shall I say it? The Golden Bomb Dynasty must fall. Then, after that, there is nobody other than Your Excellency who can build a new empire. Reinhardt would then call Kirchheis in to arrest Oberstein for treason, but because Oberstein has such a way for words, he managed to talk his way out of it. He told Kirchheis that Reinhardt must realize that in light, shadows must follow, and Oberstein would be that shadow. Reinhardt would recognize that in, the, in that moment and decide to purchase Oberstein from the nobles as his own advisor. Reinhardt did this because he realized what kind of a man Oberstein was offering himself to be. Reinhardt would tell Kirchheis, I'm not expecting friendship or loyalty in that man. I'm just making that man useful to me in order to accomplish my own objective. And later tell Oberstein, to avoid complications, both unending deceit and murder may be necessary. Understand, Oberstein? It is for that reason I have procre procured you. In exchange for the post of the three chiefs of staff, be of use to me. This all worked perfectly, this all worked perfectly for Oberstein. 
Though he had no charisma or appeal to be ruler, he could advise Reinhardt with his ideas, with Reinhardt as the enabler. At the very least, they had common ground in destroying the old system for a new one with Reinhardt as the Kaiser. <clears throat> then there is the Westerland question. Oberstein explained twice in detail as to why he felt letting the slaughter happen would lead to the most efficient outcome. Even the viewers constantly misunderstood that he, what he meant more than disagreeing with him. Reinhardt's initial idea was to send a fleet to stop the nuking of Westerland, but Oberstein said to let it happen because it would show the, the savagery of the nobles and allow a guaranteed win in, in a propaganda war to turn the Empire's 25 billion people against them. Reinhardt was outraged, of course, and asked what of the matter of the two million civilians, women, and children who would get annihilated. Oberstein said, Your Excellency, look at it logically. If you're worried about two million lives, there will be sure far more casualties if the civil war drags on. Please take that into consideration. You must become ruler first for the sake of the greater good in the future. There are times when rulers must accept the necessity of sacrifice. Later on, a man would try to assassinate Reinhardt because of this years later. Oberstein would, control, would confront the man and tell him that he should have been the target because it was his idea. Oberstein recognized how much the Lohengram dynasty hated him by adding that if he was the target instead, many of the officers and soldiers wouldn't care and probably just let it happen. But he added as he looked at the man in the eyes and the man watched the red glow from the cybernetic parts. Because of the massacre at Westerland, Prince Bronswig completely lost his popular support. People withdrew their support for him. The aristocrat federation crumbled from within, and therefore, the end of the civil war came at least three months sooner. Had the civil war lasted three more months, no fewer than 10 million more lives would have been lost, because he were able to expose the true character of the aristocrat federation headed by Prince Bronswig. He were able to prevent the further loss of those 10 million. Some viewers would be so blind as to only be fixated on the 2 million number. But would you prefer to stop the massacre and drag it on for even more casualties? The man who tried to assassinate Reinhardt cried out that it, it is easy for someone to calculate human lives that way, when their own family and loved ones are not involved. But for a man like Oberstein, who has no family or loved ones, the argument is irrelevant to him. In order, to, in order for his way of thinking to exist, Oberstein had to be a man who led a miserable life. What is interesting about this incident is that Oberstein may have tried to force Reinhardt to go along with the plan anyways. As Reinhardt thought about what should be done during the six hour gap Oberstein gave him before the attack would happen, Oberstein secretly sent a probe to Westerland to arrive within four hours. The attack happened much earlier as a result, but Oberstein would neither confirm nor deny when Reinhardt accused him of planning it all. You could say that the, the death of Kirchheis was a result of Oberstein's advice to Reinhardt. Oberstein despised that Reinhardt gave Kirchheis special treatment and advised Reinhardt several times to hold no type of favoritism as it would damage Reinhardt's image as ruler. You could see Oberstein's displeasement in the cold way he'd stare at Kirchheis as he'd watched the two. This led to him convincing Reinhardt to not let Kirchheis be the only one to freely carry a weapon as he pleases. It was because of Reinhardt agreeing with this that, that, that led to Kirchheis' death during the assassination attempt. If Kirhei still had his weapon, he would have been able to stop the assassin without sacrificing his own life in the process in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Interesting enough, you can see Oberstein rush in to protect Reinhardt from the missile. That may be an only that, that may be an anime-only scene, but it's clear regardless that Oberstein is sincere in his loyalty to the Lohengram dynasty. After the death of Kirhei, the admirals found it suspicious that Oberstein felt indifferent while Reinhardt had an emotional meltdown. As the admirals held a discussion over what to do with a shot off Reinhardt, Oberstein happened to be listening in on them in secret, and he came in when he felt the time was right. He told them to use Kirchheis' death as a way to go after the Class 1 Lindlade. Lin this would eliminate potential rivals and threats. Mittermeier realized at that moment that Oberstein has no evidence of this, and is selfishly using the death of the Kaiser's best friend for his own objectives. It makes him feel as if Oberstein planned for this to happen. This is what led to Mittermeier looking away as he couldn't face Oberstein and telling him that he hopes he never has to fight on the opposite side of him. As Reinhardt sat in this array next to Kyrgyz's deceased body, it would be Oberstein of all people that wasted no time in helping Reinhardt regain his senses and to go back on time. He told Anneros, which frustrated Reinhardt, but as Oberstein said, Reinhardt can't hide it forever and must confront her eventually. Oberstein added, Please speak to her, Your Excellency. I am not forsaking you. 
You mustn't torture yourself like this, nor leave your responsibilities to me. More importantly, rather than dwelling on the past, you must confront the future. Otherwise, this, will, this is as far as you can get. If the universe falls into the hands of someone else, Admiral Kiryais will look down in shame from Valhalla. Oddly enough, Oberstein may have foreshadowed his own death while talking to the lifeless body of Kiryais after Reinhardt left. He said out loud, Shadows must accompany their light, but if the light dims, don't shadows too? As Reinhardt took on the nobles, Oberstein came up with a plan to plant uncertainty among the nobles' trust of each other. He had Reinhardt capture Oblisser, the giant man with amazing melee abilities. Rather than kill him, Oberstein planned to have him sent back, just as he was the only survivor back then when he fled. He didn't want Oblisser to die as a martyr by Reinhardt's hands. Instead, he knew that the nobles would question Oblisser, being the only survivor, just as he himself had been questioned by Reinhardt episodes before. This time, however, Oberstein knew that a brute like Oflisser would not be able to defend himself without going berserk and going hostile, and it was that that happened. Oflisser, instead of explaining this as being a trap to make him look as if he was sold, as if he sold out, got violent and died a dishonorable death as a traitor, though he really wasn't. Since Oflisser died in suspicion of selling out, and him having been at the forefront of those who hated Reinhardt, the nobles became cautious and paranoid of one another. Oberstein planned this out perfectly, and it worked to great effect. Around this time, Oberstein would confront Frolin Mariendorf. Kiryais was no longer there, but he was concerned about her influence on Reinhardt, as she saw him as potentially, as partly, another Kiryais. She would deny his accusations of her influencing Reinhardt to be lenient on Mueller, and tell Oberstein that it was Kiryais from the grave that was influencing Reinhardt. This would be true, because throughout the series, Reinhardt would have hallucinations and dreams of Kiryais still advising him. But to Oberstein, he found it funny and idealistic, and did no more than laugh and excuse himself. On the topic of Fizan, Oberstein knew clearly what they were up to. He said, indeed, it's just how Fizan would do things. They write the script and direct, but make other people dance. On the topic of information, there was a lot that Oberstein knew, but kept to himself. As clever as he came off to be, he was very secretive out of his own personal insecurities about himself. What did he know? Further into the series, Oberstein would reach, teach Reinhardt, or perhaps remind him about the way of bloodshed, while making up a plan, Reinhardt saw that Admiro Moth <clears throat> might fail his mission and be put to death as a result. Oberstein argued that Moth is an old-fashioned man and wouldn't have it any other way if Reinhardt tried to change his mind. Regardless, Reinhardt felt unsure as Kessler would fall to blame also as his superior. Oberstein responded with, Your Excellency, while it is soiling your ears, I will say just one thing. You can't clear a path through a dense forest without uprooting some trees and rocks. Your Excellency, it seems to me as if you forget very very rudimentary things. All heroes have established thrones atop not just their enemies, but a large quantity of allied corpses as well. There are no monarchs with clean hands. Their subordinates also know that. I'd like you to consider that, at times, to grant death is also a way to repay loyalty. Reinhardt would dismiss Oberstein, but ponder this as he looked out the window. Later on, Reinhardt would learn that during a war exercise of 4 million troops, 100 perished. Though outraged as he saw this as ridiculous, Oberstein reminded him once again to look at this realistically and logically by saying, Considering that the exercises were carried out in the form of a real battle, and considering more than 4 million troops took part, the number of casualties is rather small. <clears throat> Reinhard would squint at Oberstein as he realized Oberstein means this was a necessary sacrifice for the greater good, but stay quiet as he finds it hard to accept this truth. Most amusing is the case of Anton Ferner. He used to be part of the Goldenbaum dynasty and even tried to assassinate Reinhardt in the plot. Once he failed, he pledged to serve Reinhardt and out of his similarities to Oberstein was sent to serve under him by Reinhardt. Throughout the series, he was to serve as advisor, but seemed to have kept more of a watch over Oberstein. He carefully analyzed and dissected the way Oberstein thought, seemingly awed and somewhat frightened by how brilliant his superior's mind works. And will hilariously and constantly get dismissed and ignored when he tried to give Oberstein advice. Though important in his own way, it's amusing to see Oberstein constantly swat him away like a fly. Halfway through the series, as the Galactic Empire began to take over the Alliance, Oberstein laid out his political theory on how to approach them. He said, because of several points, most opinions are that it is too early to dismantle the Alliance and place it under direct imperial rule. I agree with them. Force them to disarm and recognize a facade of autonomy. 
for our full integration for now, but I believe we should adopt a policy of impoverishing the alliance. When military spending is sharply reduced, the economy should rebound. There is no need for them to become a second Fezan. His plans, which Reinhardt agreed to, was to leave the alliance disarmed in a weak state to prevent it from flourishing. They would revitalize the economy with funds when needed. Also, the rebellion of Oscar von Ruenthal began to slowly manifest around this time, partly from instigation. It will not be only Hilda, but Oberstein, who also began to see the potential danger in Ruenthal. Ferner caught on to that Oberstein did not want Ruenthal sent to the consulship in Heinesen when he was speaking to Reinhardt. Oberstein told Ferner about Ruenthal. Wild animals only released, they become extremely dangerous. They must be kept where they can be seen on a lock and key. As Reinhardt neared the time of his marriage, Oberstein was very cautious and cruel about what to do with the Mariendors during this time. Henrik, a member of Hilda's family, had held Reinhardt hostage. He was a man afraid of being forgotten, mostly resorting to resting as he was sickly and frail. He wanted desperately to accomplish something that would not let him be forgotten in history, as his life was nearing its end at a young age. He seemed like a good man earlier in the series, but was later found out to be influenced by the terrorists. Hilda and her family would get detained after his failure, and Oberstein would suggest that the traitors should have his entire family exterminated. Before that, he suggested that if Reinhardt married, it was a historical practice to kill off the men in the wife's family to avoid potential power struggles, which was a shrewd plan against Franz von Moriendorf. Reinhardt recognized this. He would follow by telling Oberstein how precious they mean to him, and he demanded they be released and be placed back on duty to Oberstein's surprise. On the Lenin camp question, Oberstein planned to use him to lower out Murkatz by having him declare to the Alliance that he will be taking Yang Wenli to Imperial soil. Having been saved by Yang Wenli beforehand, Oberstein is certain that Murkatz will try to repay the favor. If not, they will have Yang Wenli and kill him if, if need be, anyways. This went, of course, over Lenin camp's head, but he agreed as Oberstein assured him he'd get a decent promotion out of it. But Lenin Kaff didn't realize is that Oberstein meant he would be promoted in death, as Lenin Kaff was meant to be his sacrificial lamb. Ferner recognized this afterwards and, and asked Oberstein, So what if he fails? Oberstein said, if, if Lenin Kaff fails, then so be it. We'll simply send someone else to complete the task. It's hardly necessary for the trailblazer and the one who completes the road to be one and the same. Ferner then realized that Lenin Kaff dying would be justification for the Empire to attack the Alliance once again anyways. Ferner still asked about sacrificial le sacrificing Leninkampf, to which Oberstein replied, Leninkampf cannot become a fleet admiral while he lives, but, he were, but were he to die while performing his duty, he would. Being alive is that, is that the only way to serve your country. Ferner would then think to himself, the, the, the Secretary of Defense is right most of the time, but even if he is right, it is still not necessarily acceptable, especially when one considers that one might suffer Leninkampf's fate one day. It's possible that someone hates him might speak out against him. Surely he must realize that? No, perhaps Oberstein already accepted that. To add to this statement, Oberstein admits he does not mind being hated. This plan is what led Oberstein into saying his infamous quote, Dogs eat dog food. As for cats, one has to feed them cat food. As the Lenin calf situation continued, Mittermeier would stand up against Oberstein for trying to unfairly reach Yang Wenli without evidence, a man who was retired and happily married at the time. But Oberstein would counter sarcastically at Mittermeier's speech and remind him of how he did the same thing when he arrested Lindley. Lindley. As usual, Ruento had to calm Mittermeier and help defend his stance. Oberstein would remind them that Yang had also kidnapped a high officer and escaped. No conclusion was reached as Lang would interrupt and get scolded. In a later discussion, Ruento decided to have it and debate Oberstein, though he was debated into a corner. At the Lenin Cap's suicide, Oberstein tries to throw the blame on Yang Wenli to further pursue him. Ruenthal argued that Kaiser Reinhardt might still want to try and recruit Yang, while Oberstein plans to set him up in the alliance under a high position to allow them to continue in chaos. Oberstein countered Ruenthal's accusations of being destructive for the sake of it with, It is important to gather talent, but aren't we also responsible for determining if those talents are worthy of our trust? Ruenthal already knew this was going to get petty, but he continued anyways as the debate continued with, with Mittermeier as follows. Ruenthal, so you're saying that those who come to serve his majesty must pass your trials. That all sounds great, but who will, be, who will oversee the judge's fairness and his loyalty to his majesty? Oberstein, you too can do that, can't you? Regardless of the system, the substance of military power in the, in the rake lies with you two. When you, think of, when you think I lack fairness, you have the means to depose, to depose me. 
Minamire tries to interject here, but was interrupted by Ruental. Ruental, the chief of military affairs, appears to misunderstand something. Oberstein, what misunderstanding? Ruental, it's about where the military power lies. In the Lohengram dynasty, the entirety of military power lies under the command of Kaiser Reinhardt himself. Chief Commander Minamire and I are merely his majesty's agents. Listening to what the chief of military affairs says, it sounds as though you're suggesting our privatization of military power. Oberstein, strange. If I appropriate your reasoning, you have no need to worry whether or not I am fair to his majesty from the beginning. Is it my fairness something only his majesty himself has the right to assess? Ruanthal, what sophistry? <laughs> Minamara would at this point stop the, the, the meaningless debate, but it is clear that not even Ruanthal could get an, an advantage over Oberstein. As Ferner would see the building up of hatred towards Oberstein, he thinks, Perhaps the chief of military affairs may be serving as a shield for the Kaiser by collecting all the antipathy and hostility of many admirers to himself. It wouldn't help that Oberstein interrupted Kaiser Reinhardt's wedding to announce the news of a sudden anti-empire riot, or many riots, rather. But as Minermeyer and others stared with frustration at Oberstein, Oberstein calmly said, Propitious events can wait, but misfortunes can't. Especially when it involves things that concern the security of the nation, we have the obligation to inform his majesty, regardless of what he decides in the end. Eventually, Oberstein began thinking of bloodless ways to gain victories. He stopped focusing merely on military power and slaughter, but more in using hostages instead. Binfeld and Mueller would both confront him, as Binfeld is too proud to accept this as he, as he was in favor of a full, honorable frontal assault instead of using hostages. Oberstein, seeing Binfeld as nothing more than a mindless dog, tells him, Bloody fantasies of militaristic romantics are useless at the present juncture, using the lives of less than 10,000 political offenders as bait. For a bloodless surrender is a somewhat better choice than sacrificing the lives of over a million soldiers again. Benfeld responds with, with what of honor, to which Oberstein reacts with annoyance. Benfeld tries to reason with his glorious fleet battle skills, to which Oberstein responds with, I cannot base out strategy on the magniloquence of someone with no actual track record. We're past the stage where we can resolve the situation with military force alone. Binfeld, of course, being a very proud man, became, becomes outraged that Oberstein doesn't believe he has any meaningful track record. Pushing the question about his track record, Oberstein pushes back even further by adding, I know your track records very well. How many times have you three let Yang Wenli drink the sweet wine of victory? This would be the only point in the series that someone completely loses composure against Oberstein and reacts. It is not surprising that it happened to be Benfield, but he would attack Oberstein and tackle the chief of staff out of his chair. After he was held back, Oberstein calmly and smugly puts on and puts Benfield on administrative leave and continues to give them orders as if nothing had happened. He would go on to give Mueller the role, the order of controlling the Black Lancers, but Mueller responds by saying that it will not work. It will not work as they only listen to Benfield. Oberstein counters again with, Such lack of discernment is unlike you, Admiral Mueller. The Black Lancers are one unit within the Imperial fleet. It's not Armaro Benfield's private fleet, is it? Mueller would add that Reinhardt did plan to lead an honorable and full frontal assault, to which Oberstein dared to criticize Reinhardt by saying, Such pridefulness in the Kaiser resulted in the remains of several million officers and, and soldiers being left to rot in the Isolan corridor. If we had done this two years ago, then when Yang Wenli escaped from Heinesen to Ersalon, we wouldn't have had to lose the lives of those several million so soldiers. The Empire is not the Kaiser's private property, and the Imperial fleet isn't the Kaiser's private force. Is there a law that says that the Kaiser can meaninglessly sacrifice the lives of soldiers for the sake of his personal pride? If so, it would be no different from the era of the Golden Bomb Dynasty, would it? His advisor, Ferner, is in the background thinking to himself. What the Chief Minister says is probably right, but precisely because it's right, people will likely come to detest him. Oberstein adds, I'm in command of your units as the authorized agent of His Majesty by Imperial order. If you have any objections, you should take your complaints to the Kaiser. Ferner continues to think to himself by, uh, afterwards by thinking his argument is completely right, but he just caustically criticized the Kaiser and then used the Kaiser's name to buttress his position right away. You could say there is some hypocrisy in it. No doubt the three admirals took it that way. Near the end, as Kaiser Reinhardt lay dying, Oberstein decided to use him as bait to lure out the last of the terrorists. Though it appears to be cruel, Reinhardt had agreed to it, and it was the only sure way for Oberstein to make sure that the terrorists will not come after Reinhardt's dynasty after he dies. Of course, the admirals became outraged, but had to force themselves to see, to see the logic and necessity of it. Oberstein said, 
At this stage, the Kaiser will not avoid his death, but the Longan dynasty will live on, and preparation for the future of the dynasty will wipe out the remaining fanatic terrorists. For that purpose, I merely had his majesty cooperate in his effort. What happens next is up to interpretation, as author Yoshiki Tanaka laid it out to be. Oberstein gave false information of what Reinhardt's room was. As a result, Oberstein was blown up by the bomb and wounded beyond repair. As he lay with his organs falling out of his stomach, the doctors tried to help them. But even in death, Oberstein criticized them for wasting their time by trying to save someone who can, they know cannot be saved. He told them to tell his butler of the location of his will and for his dogs to be fed his favorite chicken meat, seeing as though his Dalmatian doesn't have much time left also. Paul von Oberstein died a hated man. Still, there was a soft side to him that was only teased. That would be in the love he had for his dog. As Reinhard lay dying, Hilda did not tell him of Oberstein's death. When he asked him about it, wait, wait, um, sorry. As Reinhard lay dying, Hilda did not let him, did not tell him of Oberstein's death when he asked about him. As the legend ends, the light faded and the shadow followed. Thank you for listening.